Aid organizations are warning of a hunger catastrophe in Sudan as a result of the conflict there, which they describe as a forgotten war. Much of the world's attention has been elsewhere on Russia's fighting in Ukraine and the recent war between Israel and Hamas. Now, in Sudan, out of nearly 25 million people in need of aid, the United Nations has only been able to reach a small fraction, and funding even for that is running low. Sudan's war erupted eight months ago after a period of tension between military chief General Abdel Fattah Burhan and General Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, who is commander of the paramilitary rapid support forces. The fighting has killed more than 12,000 people so far and displaced over 6 million people. Plus, Sudan's already struggling economy is on the verge of collapse. The UN's humanitarian coordinator for Sudan says the situation on the ground is getting worse by the day. The situation in Sudan eight months after the conflict started um, is catastrophic. Um, despite the valiant efforts of the humanitarian community, the partners, the agencies on the ground, we are still facing significant challenges. Uh, we have about 7 million people displaced in Sudan, which is the highest displacement situation globally. So we are stretched in terms of our ability to respond to what is quite uh, a high number of, of uh, needs across the board. We are facing a population that is about 24.7 million people in need of humanitarian assistance. To date, we've been able to reach about 4 million um, and our goal is to hopefully reach around 18 million. Our overall uh, budget uh, our needs is about 2.6 billion. To date, we've received only 38.6% of that. For more on this, let's bring in Dalia Abdel Muniam, a former journalist and Sudanese commentator. She's now based in Egypt, Cairo. Hello, Dalia. Welcome to the program. Now, you live in Egypt, Cairo, after fleeing the recent fighting in your home country, Sudan. You've been in touch with people on the ground. What are they telling you about the conflict going on? Um, um, it's horrible. Those who are in Khartoum are still facing bombardment and fighting between the RSF and the army. And those who are in Chad, most many of them have been forced to flee for their own safety. And they're in camps, refugee camps, on the border with Chad. And the situation is horrible. It's very dire. And uh, humanitarian aid is unable to get through. And at the same time, not enough humanitarian aid is being is, is coming in to Sudan. In a sense, it's become a forgotten conflict. But for nearly 42 million Sudanese, it's not a forgotten conflict. Uh, the numbers that are coming out every week from agencies like the United Nations and the Red Cross make for frightening read, harrowing. Uh, something like half a million, half the population, nearly some 25 million Sudanese, are in need of humanitarian aid. Mm. Nearly 70% of the country's hospitals and health clinics are out of service, including yeah. schools and universities. So there's no positive information coming out of Sudan at this moment. Yeah, it, it definitely doesn't sound like that at all. Uh, how are people surviving, uh, those that you are in touch with? Through the help of local grassroots organizations and responders, you know, their local initiatives, grassroots initiatives, mainly run by, you know, youth who are just, finding whatever means they can to be able to get supplies, medical aid, and even money to those who can't. Uh, Khartoum is pretty much a battleground, a daily battleground between the army and the militia. And Darfur is pretty much now under the control of the militia. And so it's a nightmare. It's very hard for them to do it, but they're somehow still doing, you know, doing what they can. And in a way, because the state apparatus has collapsed, there is no st state apparatus at all. So it's down to the initiatives, local initiatives, homegrown grassroots initiatives that are somehow keeping the fabric of Sudanese society, you know, mm. alive. Mm. And uh, if you think about the latest attempt to mediate a ceasefire again, it seems to have failed. Why does it keep failing, you think? 
because neither side is being honest about wanting a ceasefire. I think end of the day, it's a power struggle between two military units and each one is fighting to gain control, to gain power, to gain the power. And there is no sense from them that it's a lose-lose situation in their opinion if either if they agree to a ceasefire because the conditions put in place by others by both sides on each other i don't see how anyone can can make sure that those agreements are fulfilled if they can't even agree on allowing a humanitarian passage convoy to get through how are they going to agree on ending the fighting Mm. And at the same time, international party, international actors who can have an influence are not pulling their weight, so to speak. I mean, I think more can be done from the international arena to pressure both sides to, mm. to you know, bring an end to the conflict. But mm. not enough pressure is being applied. Mm. And uh, also regional fa- actors. Yeah. Sorry to catch you there. What kind of pressure is needed? We talk about giving them pressure. What is the pressure that will really yeah. get them to say, hey, let's, let's call for a ceasefire or end this conflict? Stop the supply of arms, economic sanctions, and use, you know, and use your bilateral relationship as a way to pressure. But these three, act- these three points, those who can aren't even following through. Each side has its benefactor, each side has its supporter, and each side is continually getting the arms, the means to continue this war. And unless you cut that stream of support, arms, and money, this war will continue. And so who, will continue to funding, devastating effects. Who, not just who, in your, who, in your opinion, is funding the, this? Because you, you seem to be saying those who can stop it are not doing it because you're benefiting somehow from it. Who are these people you're talking about? Regional neighbors and regional powers in the Middle East and in Africa, they have been, they have played a big part in the continu- in this in the in the outbreak of this war, and they continue to play a big part in the continuation of this war. And at the same time, you have the European, the Western nations, like the e- European Union, the United States, the Troika, and the UN, not really having much of a say. You know, there's not there's very little interest. You know, or to bring up to bring about pressure on the parties that are helping to, you know, extend this war. And it's in the day, it's a game of politics. And at the same time, you have other conflicts going on around the world, which have taken attention. They've, you know, they've they've grabbed all the attention. So it's very hard to, you know, to stand up and say, what about us? Look at us. So mm. this is where we as Sudanese we come in, and this is where we need to do what we can. And in our case, in my case, is to work on the humanitarian side to help those who, are, who can't, who who's who need help yeah. and aren't getting any help. Mm. You've uh, talked about returning home to Sudan soon. Uh, bearing all that we've we've said right now, the challenges in a ceasefire or ending the conflict. How realistic is it for you to return home to a peaceful Sudan? Oh, every day I wake up with a different idea. One day I wake up and I think it's hopeless that I'll never see my home country again. And other days I wake up and I'm like, no, it's on the onus is on us as Sudanese to make sure that we do have a home to go back to. And it's just it's a continuous, you know, self conflict that I face. And but I truly believe that if security wise, you know, safety wise, I can go back. I think me and more thousands of others, we will do that because we're like a tree. We've been uprooted, and you know, we we this is our home. It's given us so much, and it's taken so much from us. But it's our home, and no matter where you go, no matter how welcome you're made to feel or unwelcome, it's never the same feeling as being in your own place. And I think for me, that's the driving factor that I am working on, and. I hope that maybe this time next year, if I if I speak to you again, I'll be like I'll be speaking from Khartoum, or I'll be speaking from other some other city in Sudan. So I really, I really, uh, I really hope so too. And um, we will keep reporting on this until the world pays enough attention. Dalia Abdel Moniam, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me.
Now, the escalating war has made it dangerous for journalists to report from many parts of Sudan. But our correspondent, Mario Muller, succeeded in gaining exclusive access to the south of the country into the remote and rebel-controlled Nuba Mountains, where more and more people flee for safety. These remote parts of Sudan have become a place of refuge for people fleeing the war. And some of them can now tell their stories. My name is Hannah Hamoda. I fled from war in Khartoum after I lost my two children and one of my legs. To tell their stories, we had to enter Sudan illegally via South Sudan to reach the remote Nuba Mountains region. Checkpoints are guarded by the SPLMN rebel group. They have been fighting the Sudanese government for almost 40 years, demanding self-determination and secularism. Now the war has reignited this old conflict. As we're traveling with German NGO Kapanamur, we are allowed to pass. After an eight-hour drive, we reach Agiri camp. Thousands of internally displaced people have sought refuge here, including Hane Hamoda. When the bomb hit our house, I didn't lose my legs straight away, and I didn't immediately sense that it was severed. My body just felt numb. She was taken to hospital. When she woke up from surgery to amputate her leg, the doctors told her that she had also lost her two sons, Awatif and Abrar, who were only two and four years old. My children were adorable. We played a lot together, but God has taken them away from me. I will leave it to God to judge the government. I don't blame God for it. Roughly a quarter of a million people reached the remote Nuba Mountains region. This local church played a crucial role in providing sanctuary. Many people in the congregation here today say they have this man to thank for their lives, Pastor Musa Kodi. A few weeks after the fighting broke out, he organized 23 buses which transported 1,500 residents of Khartoum to safety in the Nuba Mountains. Our people scattered, our people died, our people they were not uh, they were not having food. The bus carry more than the number that he is supposed to carry because people are running from there and they were not able to stay there. So we just filled the bus and they face a lot of uh, hunger on the way. People in this region have to get by without help. Aid organizations can't access it because of the fighting. Almost 10,000 people have found refuge in this camp. Now at least they have a sense of safety, but not much else. They lack clean water, proper food and shelter, and the only medical facility has not enough medicine. Despite what she's gone through, Hane Hamoda says she won't give up. She has two other children to take care of. I do now struggle so that I may make them educate, so that I may make them be happy. They should not feel that I am, I, we don't have a complete mother. That is why I'm practicing to do very every activities around the world so that I may not let them to say that we lost our mom. With the war still ongoing, many of the stories of those who have been affected are only starting to trickle out. What's clear is that the effects will last well into the next generation.